So what I wanted to do is tell the story of a single earthquake just to break things up because, you know, everyone likes to see some cool pictures of earthquakes and to talk about what we learned for a small earthquake that barely broke the ground surface. So this one was maybe more of a partial rupture than a full rupture, uh, or it also broke on a piece of the San Andreas fault that has mixed behavior creep and uh, seismic split. So it uh, was relatively small for the amount of fault that broke because most of the stress is released asynchronously there. So what I'll talk about is, is uh, generally about this place, Parkfield, is well known for earthquake recurrence anyway because there was a prediction there. And then I'll show what we observed in 2004. I'll talk about what I think that means for the top of fault zones in terms of fracturing. And then I'll show what also we think it means for the pillar seismic record. So here's what happened. So you can go to this place, and uh, it's so famous they have a cafe called the Parkfield Cafe, and it says, uh, be here when it happens. It's hard to read, but uh, earthquake capital of the world. So, you know, there's like tourism, geotourism for earthquakes. And the, these pictures on the left here show the part of California we're talking about. So Los Angeles would be uh, down here, San Francisco is there, San Andreas Fault goes along the coast here. And each of these gray zones shows the area where an earthquake was felt, kind of the, the source area. And uh, this shows each year. So, oh yeah, so 1901. See, there was one, then 1922, 1934, 1966, and actually in 2004 there was one. And so they're always basically at the same place, and this one looks like it was bigger because the felt in, uh, dome range is larger, but it was the same magnitude, so it shows the bias in felt distribution that when you have more people around, they can, it looks like it, they're more sensitive uh, to the record because this was uh, four, you know, 40 years of population growth in the region. So, it, but we know from the geology that it was, and the geophysics, it happened basically on the same piece of fault. And so there was an idea that, okay, well, it's about every 22 years recurrence between these earthquakes. And it was pretty good, you know, 34 was maybe a little early, 66 was a little late. So there was a big investment of money Okay, we can we can capture an earthquake. So they called it the Parkfield Earthquake Prediction Experiment, and they made some investments to uh, put lots of GPS and laser range finding, seismometers, many observational systems to wait for that earthquake. So they so some people said, well, see, no wonder earthquake prediction will never work because we just don't understand earthquakes that well. But it kind of worked because it was basically the same earthquake in general sense, although in detail it was different. So this earthquake uh, occurred along the fault. It was about, uh, you see the scale here, so the total zone of cracking was about um, maybe 40 kilometers. And this map shows the uh, earthquake response. So we went out with some, some people and my student, okay, and uh, U.S. Geological Survey people, California Geological Survey, and uh, the epicenter was here, it was magnitude six. And there were a lot of aftershocks, so those are the red ones. But also, so the red shows where we mapped cracking. And then the, the yellow shows where we checked the faults and there was no cracking. And then the diamond, or the triangle shows where there was liquefaction, so a pretty strong ground motion and we materials, and then there were as many pictures we took, and the quadrilateral means that there was a, basically, let's say if the fault goes, you know, in front of my desk, then I put, might put some nails here, and here, and some over there, and I'll measure the distance between all the nails, and if there's any subsequent motion, so let's say after slip, then these distances would change. So it's easy, it's very cheap to do. And there was knowledge from 1966 that Parkfield is a piece of a fault that likes to have after slip. So when it slips, 
the main shock occurs, but then it keeps creeping kind of an accelerated rate for some time afterwards. So that's what what was going on. And this is unusual, so not so many faults do this. Crust of faults. I think many subduction zones have a lot of, of creep and maybe some uh, similarity to this part of the Panadrix where it's a lot of mixed behavior of seismic and aseismic flicks. So, we, so this was the model uh, from strong ground motion and geodesy inverting these observations to the fault surface to show what the flip distribution would look like. So here you see it's, uh, you know, zero to almost 30. So it's not that long of a, of a rupture. They had a 15 kilometer deep model, but you can see most of the slip is in a few patches and less than a meter, mo almost everywhere, uh, even 50 centimeters. What was important about this, why it's, it's uh, challenging for earthquake prediction, was that it was on the same piece of fault, so the same segment broke. But in 1966, we know the epicenter or the hypocenter was here on the north, and it ruptured south. In 2004, the hypocenter was on the south side, ruptured north. So it's in detail not the same earthquake, but it been far enough away, both of them were magnitude sixes, both of them were on the same part of the fault. So this is the kind of a complexity of discussing, you know, earthquake forecasting and how much detail do you need to make the forecast. For seismic hazard, they were the same because the shaking was basically looked quite similar, especially if you look at the, aside from the bias, the observational bias uh, of, you know, looking like it was felt more broadly, basically you know, the shaking was about the same. So we went there. This is what it looks like in from the air. So there's a bridge here that uh, was deformed. There's a little uh, small stag here, so a low spot along the fault, and then it continues like this. Uh, here's a map view of that that terrace, the fluvial terrace, and and so north. We're looking south in the photograph, and, and if you rotate it around, you see this stag is here, and the drainage, this little drainage is this one, and this is the river here, so this small drainage. So we went there. Here's uh, my student and I. Mostly we worked where this, this yellow arrow shows up here by the town of Parkfield, this field that I just showed. So that's the stag. And here's the map of it. So what we did was we set up our surveying instrument, a total station, and we measured every single crack. So 369 cracks, so just for one or two days of work. And we could see exactly where they went. And what was really impressive is that they're right on the topographic break. So this shows again that the earthquakes are recurring where the geomorphology tells us they have occurred in the past. And so you can see this cracking is a little bit complex under the bridge. Then these cracks go along and they get to the sag and actually make this very nice right step, which we expect for right lateral fault to cause subsidence. And there it is. There's the, the depression in the topography. And then it goes along, goes here. And then there's a little bit of a bend here that's a left bend. And it's right where this little pressure is, bridge is. So the, the cracking in the earthquake was very consistent with the longer term tectonic geomorphology default zone. And so one thing just to keep in mind then is that the shear zone would be, uh, you know, some orientation like this, and we can measure an angle between the cracks and the shear zone. So the cracks are n echelon. They're not parallel to the shear zone, but they they step because they're more opening than pure uh, slip. So here's some of the cracks, and then we wrote these up in these papers, 2006 and 2011. And here's some details just to show we mapped, we surveyed, and here's Nathan, the student, Nathan Toke, and you see all the cracks in here. And here you can see some more cracks around the sag. Here's the crack here. So we were using paint so we knew which ones we surveyed because there were so many we were getting confused. So, uh, so you see here's one. These cracks here, 
So it's very small surface rupture, almost right at the edge uh, of surface rupture. Here's this uh, site we call Phoebe's Panel and this trench, and here's this cracking going up the hill right here. So when we surveyed, we measured the, the end points of the crack, but we also measured the opening, how much opening there was. So that's why some of the, the lines are, are you know, bigger than other ones, because we scale the width of the symbol by the amount of opening. And so here's some more cracks around the sag coming through. This is right here on the side. And so then again, if we take the simple shear zone model, we have the theta, which is the angle between the the line of the crack and the shear zone. We can do some analysis. Oh, I already showed these pictures. So here's the, this is a kind of analysis of the cracking. So here's theta. And this is, all these are distance along the fault zone. So it's 450 meters. And so what you can see is the angle between the cracks and the shear zone varied, but it's usually, you know, sort of 30 degrees or so. And then the opening is what we observed. So how much opening was there? So it was between one and, and four centimeters, how much the cracks were open. And so what we can do is make this calculation. We can say, well, if you take the, the opening on a crack, that has an angle with the shear zone, you can convert that opening into shear zone perpendicular and shear zone parallel components just through the trig, uh, trigonometry. And so what we found was the shear zone, if we look down here at the, this, this fourth one, this is the shear zone parallel uh, motion. And so what it means is there was about one or two centimeters of shear along the fault zone that this recorded. But what's really important and interesting to me is that the shear zone normal was one to four centimeters. So that means that the shear zone actually opened. So when, when the, the ground sheared like this, it tore, but it kind of dilated the fault zone. And, and this is an interesting observation that sometimes we see, you know, if you have a, it's called dilatancy. So if you have a, some rocks like from a river and you can organize them in your hand and you can pack them together, and they'll maybe be very tightly packed. But if you, you try to move them, you know, they'll, they'll kind of ride up on each other like this. And the, the, as they ride up on each other, it, it makes the volume increase. And so maybe that's what happened here, is that the shear zone, it, it sheared, and these, these blocks rotated and opened, and it actually pushed the walls of the shear zone apart. So it's a, to me, it's quite an interesting thing to see in our survey. Uh, so then the map, this is just the map at the bottom. So you see the, this is where the bridge was, and here's the crack coming around the sag. So now we can do it in a crack coordinate system. So this is just to take the, well, this is where we could measure. So sometimes we can measure not just the opening, but if there was any shear. And so the the normal displacement, this would be the op opening of the crack. And then the parallel is just how it goes with each crack. So it's mostly right lateral on these cracks, so they open, but some of them also shear a little bit. So it's like dilation and shear on the crack. And then the vertical was interesting because most of it was very small across the fall. The, the cracks were just open. They didn't do much vertically. However, near the sag, the, it depends on your reference frame, but one side shows positive vertical, the other side shows negative vertical. So we could see the sag opening in the crack. That's why there's these blue ones here showing negative. That's these cracks on this side of the sag to show the depression. Mm. Good question. Well, we think, you know, just the conditions here in this field, it's uh, no real big change in the uh, uh, hydraulic characteristics, so it's not raining or, you know, no. So we think that this is all just shearing, not shaking or anything else. Good question, though. Um, here, this goes down, so it's closer to the water, but it's uh, maybe just one or two meters lower. But the main field, which is where these cracks are, and 
I agree. So especially if you look at overall cracking around the bridge, it's more complex here. There's two two bands of cracks. This is the bridge right here. So yeah, the cracks are different when you're near to the water. And that this is this line is supposed to show the terrace riser. So the field comes here, we go down about one to two meters on the small terrace into the water, that's the blue, and then under the bridge. I think the main way I would say is that the, the overall the geometry is so consistent with shearing, right on the fault zone. You know, here's the overall map. So uh, there's something special about the fault zone. You could say, oh, there's just more fluid in the fault zone. But in general, if it was due to swelling or ground shaking, I would expect to see cracks other places, and there aren't any. So mostly it's by the, the fact it's right on the fault. So consistent, and uh, as all this, these analyses of the measurements show, it's consistent with right lateral shear, whereas the shaking or swelling would, might be more slope dependent. Uh, depending on which way the slope was, you would expect to see that drive in the crack. So, fortunately, we went just two days after the earthquake. And so we could, so this is the reason for, you know, rapid response. You just have to get it. And actually, uh, then it rains like two weeks later and the crack. Well, if you, so if you have a, just a crack you don't know much about, you want to know the context. So, for, again, here, I'm looking at the surrounding landscape and I see the crack relative to the rest of the topography. So right away you can say, okay, it's not a crack that's associated with a slope failure because it's in the middle of the field and it has a special orientation, in this case parallel to the fault. And then you look for more and what's their spatial association does it have some consistency. So for me, you know, it just always map. Map as much as you can with good detail. So this is the uh, total station, but now hopefully most people have access, like if you have DGPS, differential GPS, so you could do that. And then you just want to code the features, so you know, end, middle, end, and then you may measure, okay, two centimeters, and then you can type it in, or we did it all manually, so we just wrote down everything. But uh, I think maps like this are extremely valuable. But you have to, it might take time, you know. So if it's a 100 kilometer long rupture, maybe you need some teams. And so you, you know, divide up, okay, we'll do these, do this, do that, and then everyone share and everyone do it consistently. That how, how consistent the cracks are, they're perfect in terms of their pathway along the fault zone. Yeah, well, not, the, the, they change their angle a little bit. So that's what this uh, diagram here is showing. This top, this is the angle. So it's changing a little bit. Some are, you know, oriented parallel almost to the shear zone, so low theta, and some are high. You know, some of these were almost 90 degrees, so they were like this for the shear zone. But in general, always, um, mostly, you know, this 30 degree initial on geometry. So you can see here, see how the, as you come around the edge of the step over, it gets quite quite sharp because it's it's not simply shearing, it's the end of the fault tip as it steps the other one around the sag. So this would we would expect if you wouldn't be consistent oriented. Okay, good good question. So let's so we already discussed this Shear zone model. So one one thing that, and this is what Pico was already asking about as well. So this really the problem is, well, how do we get the signal of the earthquake up through the fault, through this weak material, the velocity strengthening, non-seismogenic, non-consolidated material? So uh, here's a kind of a uh, this was from a presentation they gave where at at depth the fault may have this these discontinuities and step overs, but really we're worried just about the very top of the fault zone. And so the very hun last hundred meters of the fault zone is probably these little shear zones, like what we just mapped, these little initial on things. 
and we don't know how deep they go. I say 100 meters, but you know it depends. We have to, you know, you can see here in um, the Schultz plot, it might be the upper kilometer behaves this way until it gets really hot enough that it, and high enough confining stress that we really have frictional behavior. But the upper 100 meters might be uh, this kind of continued dilating uh, initial on shear zone, and it could be a single zone or multiple. So this paper, they talked about these belts of shear zones with how some ruptures looked. So for example, uh, Mudrik, when you went to those Sumatra, it was pretty narrow always, right? Or was it some wider belt? Yeah. But so, so this is the question that goes to Tico question, for example, is why would the rupture belt be wide or narrow? And so maybe it has something to do with the materials at the surface, or it has something to do with how the, the, the rupture is coming up from depth, and does it spread out or does it stay focused? And so I did some, this now so you guys know, many of you know what are experts of Coulomb. So this is trying to show, uh, this is depth. Uh, zero to minus five kilometers. And what I was trying to show is as the earthquake, you know, it ruptures along the fault, but it also comes from depth towards the surface. So as the tip of the earthquake is coming to the surface, it puts stress on this volume. And so in a way, the cracks are going to maybe be not exactly above the, the fault tip, but somewhere nearby where there's weak material that can deform. And so that the red is so increased Coulomb stress parallel to the fault. So now you guys are experts in this. And you can see that it, it can be a wide zone around that fault tip. The fact that we see that it's just right above the fault means that this is probably very weak material. But if you have like a new deposit of, a, let's say, an example might be if you have a volcanic eruption, you have 100 meters thick pyroclastic flow that goes over a fault. The earthquake occurs as it gets to the bottom of the pyroclastic flow that's never been faulted before. It may send the cracks over and find some pathway that's maybe not exactly above the deeper rupture. Maybe it goes straight up, but uh, this shows this, to me, is an interesting question of complexity as the rupture approaches the surface. And, you know, we've talked about rupture going along the fault, but it's also interesting what happens when it comes up. Yeah, I think so. So this would be interesting in ruptures that you need to know the geology, fairly high resolution, because if it goes through a mountain side, maybe it's bedrock, but then it goes in the valley, might have very thick sedimentary package. Or here, so many volcanoes, you could go through a big volcanic deposit, and this would affect the what you see at the surface, I'm sure. So. The, the final thing that was, to me, quite interesting about the Parkfield earthquake in 2004 was, as I said, you know, we, we mapped all these cracks, but at the same time, another geologist named Lean Camper, he's a famous USGS guy, he had his uh, laser system, and he was measuring distance, uh, the change over 70 meter wide aperture, so, so the width was 70. And while we measure two centimeters of cracking over just, you know, a meter, he had 6.6 over the same time. Um, and, and so that means that the wider you measure, the more deformation you get. So that means that, the, that, that there's some diminished slip as you come up to the surface. So here's how I made a model. So... Again, I was teaching you guys dislocations on uh, the first day. This uses the simple 2D dislocation. And then what I, here's what we observe is in the field itself, we have these two centimeters of offset. But then over the 70 meter width, it was six. And then actually further out was the GPS measured even more like 10 or 20 centimeters of offset at like 10 kilometer width. So, you can model this showing that as you come up from depth, maybe 
a, below a kilometer, you might have 20 centimeters of slip. But then as you come up the fault, you start to lose slip. And so here's seven, and there's two in the last maybe 50 meters. And so it again shows this, this, you know, the geologist measures two centimeters, but it's not really reflecting what happens at depth. So if you calculate the moment from two centimeters of slip, really the moment might be more dominated by the 20 centimeters at depth. So you'd be off by factor 10 in the moment calculation. So this is a problem for small earthquakes because the gradient slip is large as you go down dip. I think the big earthquakes, this, they break all the way and it's representative of 10 meters at the surface that could be 10 meters at depth. So this was uh, it, interesting to me as, a, as one of the special situations for small earthquakes like maybe six. Question? Also shows that when I was teaching you with the uh, dislocations, you can do fairly interesting calculations, very simple, just in Excel or MATLAB to explore these kinds of relationships. So just to finish my presentation, just a little on paleo seismology, because I know many of you are interested in trenches. So what does this look like when you dig? So what was it? So there's a student, his name is Nathan. He did his PhD, and then here was his assistant named Ken. And so they dug this trench here, and it was so wet. So they had to just dig the mud, and uh, so you see they used the, um, it used the benched shoring, or a benched design. So that means that you dig down wide, and then in the middle you dig down again. So it goes down, and then we call this a bench, and then down again for safety, because you can't have too deep uh, and too narrow, because they can collapse, right? And then in the middle here, these are called hydraulic shores, so they're they're jacks that hold the walls apart for safety. So he, so Nate dug this trench, and then you see the he's logging in kind of a classic style with grid paper, measuring all of the units. Here he's showing some visitors what he sees. And so here, so we have photo mosaic at the bottom, and so this goes across that sag. That, uh, where the cracks went. And this is actually before the earthquake. So the earthquake was in September 2004, and this is in June 2004. So he was there digging, wondering, well, what does an earthquake look like when it comes through here? We never had seen one, well, maybe in 1966. And so what he saw was this very, um, just really this sagging type relationship. So as you go to the middle of the sag, just the, the blocks just keep stepping down, and in the middle of the sag, they're the oldest. And then as you come up higher, they get younger and younger. And one of the things that we didn't really see very much good evidence of big earthquakes, where you have big discontinuities, it was just consistent with kind of this slow, steady uh, creep or these small earthquakes, just every 20 years, you know, two centimeters. And then 20 years later, two so you do this for, you know, some of these dates are 2,000 years. You build this little sag depression and fill it with sediment. And so the, the surrounding materials are the fluvial sands of the terrace, sands and gravel. But this sag was really a persistent feature. It just stayed there, the big hole forms in the middle of the terrace. And just the bottom keeps dropping, dropping, dropping. Yes. Yeah, let me show you where this is. This was, uh, this trench is, it, it, it's right here. So um, it would be right, sorry, it's this, uh, that trench log comes from this one, MST4 right here. But we dug other ones too, but the MST4 was our main, main one. Yeah, but you see it's already in the sag, and so, you know, this crack line is coming in, and then going out, there's already two cracks. So it's already in the sag, but it's not in the most active part of the sag, because the lowest topography is here. So the, the location of the depression most recently moved to the north. 
So this MST04, it's uh, right here. Yes, it's on the far end of that depression. And uh, so you see the topography goes low. And then, and the other thing was we could see these, these uh, four fault zones cutting through. And when we went back in, in September after the earthquake, we could see that the, the main active faults were, were this fault and this fault. So you see four full faults active over the 2,000 years, but in the earthquake, just these two got activated. So it's quite interesting. And so here's some zoom relationships. And like this is fault zone one in here, this kind of a sand body that rotated. And over here, fault zone two. So this is a very challenging site, but Nathan's very good at just working really hard to really see all the details of the sediment. It's very uh, careful description to him. This was maybe uh, six weeks to do this project. So, uh, and then he went back again another time six weeks. So he's kind of a crazy guy, but uh, very nice results, you know. So just you have to put the time in. And so, just to summarize, here's the detail of this sand. You can see in the the middle here. It's a few different ages, but mostly uh, around 2,000 years old. But then coming up here, this one's actually quite a bit younger. So probably this is a bad date. It's the old charcoal that, that came in. It's not really representing the age of the deposit. We don't know. This one is younger, maybe more consistent since it's so close to the surface. But the net effect is that this sagging is really continuously occurring and always producing this depression that the sediments keep going in. So what, what they came up with, this is the final cartoon, was that these, you know, this model for formation of fault and stratigraphic patterns observed in trench with moderate repeating earthquakes is it just, you know, keeps dropping down, keeps filling in over time. And so we get this sag form with deep uh, thickness of these organic rich sediments. So this, this place is really wet. That's, yeah, so one charcoal here, 1440 to 1640, so uh, only 500 years old. Then this charcoal, which is only uh, 50 centimeters deeper, is 2,000 years old. So either this very slow sedimentation rate, or this is an old charcoal. You know, it moves around on the landscape for a long time, and then it's incorporated into the deposit. So this, sometimes it's called the trital. So it has an inherited age. So it's the maximum age, the sediment has to be younger than this. So, uh, well, no, not very well, because we think this is formed by many earthquakes, all these small ones. And we didn't see any good single earthquake event evidence. So our conclusion was that this relationship in this trench is most consistent with small earthquakes only. Because there was uh, no clear evidence of large unconformities or big uh, fissures. So if you break the ground by three meters, you'll have a sometimes big holes open up. You'll fill them with material and have an unconformity. There's no nothing like that that we could see for sure here. So we concluded that this is only moderate earthquakes. Well, so you need to have good evidence. So a big unconformity over a fish or some kind of very um, definite evidence. And then bracketing radiocarbon ages. So something older than it, something younger. And so next week we'll discuss this more and we'll actually use some practical activities to interpret. This is more of a special case. It's unusual because it's only small earthquakes. 
And so here's the picture of the standard variable. So we just were looking at this plate here. Yes, although it was defined by the prior earthquake, so it's uh, kind of self-consistent. So if I go to the beginning, so this is time. So in 2004, this is September to uh, late October versus dextral displacement, not on a quadrilateral, but the same signal of a meter. So the, the fault would be in front of me here. It's a, a like in this case, it's, it's a thin wire, and it has an anchor there and an anchor there, and you can measure the change in length of the wire, and then convert it to fault parallel motion, and so actually there's multiple of them, but the closest one to our site was this WKR1, and so the earthquake actually only caused this much motion, which was at this place about 10 centimeters, but after the earthquake for a month, it kept creeping, and so the total motion was like, oh sorry, it was two, two cent, one centimeter in the earthquake at that place. And we measured, you know, in our survey, which was uh, actually five days after the earthquake, we have these two centimeters. So you can compare that day, but afterwards the, the, it kept going and it, it was almost, you know, two, three times more after and what happened in the main earthquake. So this is another unusual behavior that we see in Hartsville was the afterslip. And so when you calculate the moment, the seismic moment from the main shock is about the same as the seismic moment of the afterslip. So usually we think seismic moment for a main shock dominates the moment, and if there's any afterslip, it's small, 1%, 10%. But here, same, 100% of the deformation was in, you know, main shock and after shock, or after slip was the same. And most of this after slip was a size, some small earthquake, but it's just creeping. So what this could mean is that the deep slip happens seismically. You get 20 centimeters down here, but it takes time for that to propagate to the surface and shear. So this model that I have here, this is representing date five days after the earthquake. But a month later, this may have continued to, to uh, why we chose the site. Yes, because it's uh, also, um, it, when you choose this paleo seismic site, you want to have some sedimentation. Because in this place, like many places, but here is uh, many animals, little rodents, they dig in the ground and they destroy the stratigraphy because they're burrowing. And so on the sides, like over here, there's no, we can't see anything because so many animals were digging. But here, because the, it was wet and because there was sedimentation, the animals they didn't want to go in there. So we had good preservation of the record. Well, next week when we go to trenching, we'll spend a lot, some more time discussing fighting. But it's most important to take time to discuss and do some detailed mapping. So you need a map like this, so you can look and say, okay, well, you know, this is a big terrace. You know, maybe these places aren't too interesting, but oh, there's this depression. Maybe it captures the sediment. The, the point though is that you don't want to capture too much sediment because the record's too deep. And if you have to dig by hand, you know, People can usually only dig about two meters deep in most cases, and a machine maybe can go four meters. But so you need to find your target within about four meters. So it needs to have optimal sedimentation rate, not too much. Not he does. These are. Uh, it was so wet he couldn't have a very deep trench. So you see, he's about two, maybe two and a half meters maximum. Um, maybe three in some places. But most of them are only two meters deep. Oh, so this was a very, for me, sad thing. Okay, it's not really terrible, but we we made these measurements on this day, on uh, October 1st. And then by, uh, I think, around this time, right here, rain. So 
the, the cracks continued to grow. And so what I wanted to do was go back and survey again. And I think we would have seen the cracks growing and, and integrating. And they probably would have shown more shearing. It would have been so cool to survey them once the way we did and then have really good geometric control, survey them again to show the growth. And, but we couldn't go back because then it was, I was teaching some, you know, I had other responsibilities. It was stupid because it's so important. And, but then it rained by the end of the month. It rained like crazy and they were gone. So we lost our chance. Yeah, for sure, right? Yeah, so you have to re respond quickly. But, but one thing, I think the lesson is, many lessons, but one is to survey, but then keep checking, because sometimes this after flip can be quite interesting and teaches us more about the event, but, you know, we just go with the idea that it all happened already, just measure out here, but it's good to measure and then check for change. <laughs>